What used to be small arcade focused events have evolved over the decades into an industry with huge prizes ranging up into the tens of millions of dollars. But is this actually what gamers are looking for? Today we have with us Marcus Howard to talk about the esports industry, its past and future, and how Web3 technology could be an integral part of that. For those listeners who don't know you, can you give us a quick rundown of who you are and what you do? Sure. So welcome everyone. Marcus Howard uh, on LinkedIn, Marcus Esports Howard, I guess also on Facebook. Uh, my parents got me Super Mario Brothers 3 for Christmas when I was six. It inspired me to want to know everything about video games, the technology behind it. In the ninth grade, I started uh, making coding my first app as a video game on the TI-83 Plus graphing calculator. Fast forward 10 years, IT degree. Fast forward another 10, 15 years, uh, 15 years of software development experience, 10 years in the gaming industry, five years in esports. I published this book about gaming and esports to help 16 year old me and my parents and my teachers as a middle school high school student i currently teach uh, esports business and trends at johnson c smith university a historically black college in north carolina um, the gaming industry i'm honored selected me as one of 50 people worldwide for their inaugural cohort of the future class so people 50 people who are building a more inclusive future of the gaming and esports industry and last year i was honored that linkedin selected me as one of its 20 top voices for sports. So essentially what I do is teach parents, educators, and businesses how to leverage video games and esports to align with their personal and business goals. It's an honor to have you on the show, truly. Thank you for the invitation. So I wanted to start with the kind of like a state of the nation for esports. Um, many of the people in our audience are hardcore gamers with a keen interest in esports. Uh, truth be told, uh, Ultra's founders met while playing CSGO. And since you've been so consistently involved over the past decade, I'd be interested to hear your take on how esports have evolved and where you think they're going. It's a great question. You know, ironically, a couple of weeks ago, I saw a kind of article posted. It's called The Oral History of Esports. And, and everyone likes to point out kind of 1972, kind of the first esports tournament at Stanford University. And in that article, most of the narrative kind of jumps immediately to kind of the 90s and PC gaming um, and basically PC gaming the entire time, conveniently neglecting the arcade portion of that history, which is, in my opinion, where the culture, the soul of esports really started, uh, which coincidentally happens to be where the urban community uh, really kind of congregates. So I, I think that esports is is growing. I think it's grown. At, it, it ran before it could walk. So it went from crawl to run and kind of skipped this walk phase. So now we're seeing kind of a correction as the global ecosystem really tries to find the alignment of, of the value of esports versus like what was sold. And I think you, you know, being involved in the Web3 ecosystem and, you know, play to earn gaming in, in the blockchain ecosystem at large, you probably see a lot of parallels there. Yeah, absolutely. Wait, 1972? Are we talking Pong? I have to look it up. I, I'm blanking on the game, but it's definitely, it was 1972 at Stanford. I, there are so many books that cited it. I, I, so I, forgive me for, for missing on the game. It, it wasn't Space Invaders. It was some other game, but definitely 1972. There are photos of it, um, you know, just students playing this game, several computers kind of linked together playing uh, the first tournament at Stanford University. I wanted to ask my next questions about how tournaments are played, but I'd like to actually take a pause and talk a little bit about um, what you were saying about how the roots of esports happened in arcades and uh, within urban communities. Like I grew up on the East Coast in the States and uh, my first like quote unquote tournaments were playing like, you know, Super Street Fighter with my friends in like the local 7-Eleven, right? I mean, like that's where everybody, you know, would go down and you put down five bucks and whoever was the winner got to play for the day, right? Probably a lot of people in the audience who have never participated in any anything esports related so maybe let's start with how you see that industry like what are esports today um esports today is very high production value kind of flashy shiny coin um, trying to it's best to mirror traditional sports when you think about the super bowl or the nba finals or or the stanley cup finals 
at least here in the West, and, and I think you could broadly say that about worldwide, there's a focus on doing these high production value marquee events. Um, the International, I believe, is in Seattle every year. They typically sell out the entire stadium in under an hour. Um, and, and it's one of the biggest events with, I think, the largest tournament prize in the world is $40 million, which is a, a combination of some money from the publisher and a percentage of sales crowdsourced from all the players. But that's what everyone thinks about when they see esports, because that's the industry does a very good job of, of, I'll say, conditioning the ecosystem to think that's what esports should be. And part of that is a function of most of the money driving esports today is from traditional sports. So either professional players or team owners, you know, from that, that section of the ecosystem. So the traditional sports is bringing that lived experience into esports. That's why you have esports. We're starting to see esports kind of tournament slash venues. You've got team managers and jerseys and broadcast rights and all the things you would expect with, with traditional sports. I think the larger opportunity for esports is more grassroots focused, uh, you know, leveraging esports for a business the same way a business would use social media, both for kind of digital employee engagement and digital customer engagement, basically part of a sales funnel. Uh, but I, that's contrary. And I think most people will tell you that you have to have these flashy tournaments um, at these major venues with all the production that goes into it in order for esports to be real, real. I wonder about who those people are. Like, are they people that benefit from uh, that large production value or are they people that want to uh, have esports go in that direction because that's, you know, kind of like what's most engaging, what's most visually spectacular, what's most fun for people that are participating? I think you need the flashy high production value events in order to justify what I would consider um, inflated valuations of these organizations, these which were formerly teams, but teams quickly learned that you can't survive um, as as just a team. Esports functionally is a loss leader. If you, you go to the um, NPR interview with the Riot Games founders, the, how I built this, they say they created esports as a marketing channel to get people into the ecosystem to turn around and either buy copies of the game or DLC or merchandise or some kind of microtransaction. It was never really intended for it to grow and be sustainable. It's a loss leader. Again, it's not designed to make profit. And if you think about uh, the Apple and Epic Games lawsuit where they had to go uh, Epic had to share publicly its its EBITDA, uh, you know, its financial earnings report from, I want to say, 2019. I think this number is, I'm going to get this number wrong now. I, I want to say it was like $187 million or maybe $254 million was a loss for the year that was categorized as overestimated esports opportunity. So I think publishers are learning that, but teams still need to continue to kind of have this again this flashy shiny high production value so they can say that phase clan is worth over a billion dollars do you think it's what fans want i think fans want to play games for fun and be a part of the action i think some fans want that kind of fandom that you see with traditional sports but you know, most fans are also gamers. I think that's one of the biggest differences between esports and traditional sports is that when you're watching traditional sports, most the average person can't do the thing that they're watching on TV or live. Versus in esports, most of the spectators are also gamers. And you may have more talented people or equally talented people in the audience as you have, uh, you know, on the main stage. So I, I think. While it's cool to say, hey, we've got these big events, I think it's even cooler to say, hey, my next door neighbor was able to go compete and win $5,000. I think that's actually really interesting because what you're actually talking about is kind of the democratization of tournaments and esports, making sure that anybody can play, anybody can win, and the, the whole process is kind of like transparent and open. And in that context, like a big flashy tournament stage, not not super relevant. That's right. It's not only is it is it inaccessible for attendees who can't pay the ticket price to get in, but those events, because of their production value, require 
kind of these blue chip sponsors like your Mercedes Benz and I don't know, MasterCard, these Fortune 500 companies to sponsor those events. So your average like mom and pop you know, store, whether it be a, a bakery or a coffee shop, can't afford the price tag to sponsor an event like that. So now what you're doing is excluding you know, 99% of businesses. Right, immediately comes to mind uh, indie gamers uh, and people that are producing indie games. And for them, having a funnel where you produce a tournament and you ensure that the players play your game uh, is very valuable, but you're not going to be able to, as an indie developer, drop, you know, $2 million as the price tag for uh, producing some sort of tournament at a really high level. Exactly. I think you see the same problem at, at these marquee kind of conferences and expos. Uh, you know, unless you're a larger indie publisher or indie, indie studio or you work with a publisher, you can't afford the, the booth space, right, to exhibit your game. There are some organizations like Indie Mega Booth and um, forgetting the other ones, but a handful of organizations that will basically pay a for a larger booth space and then kind of subsidize the cost so indie studios can have um, exhibition space. Uh, and in that way, they're democratizing access, but you see the exact same thing in the larger gaming industry. I guess really what we're talking about here is the future of esports. And to my mind, and I, I may be a little bit biased because we're actually working on tournament software that leverages Web3 technology, NFT technology. But I believe that much of the uh, problems that we've been talking about, the solutions lie in that space. And I think I'd like to talk a little bit about Web3 technology and its potential impacts on esports. So if your game... Uh, let's start with gaming in general. Uh, I think Web3 is a very different beast from gaming, uh, both conceptually and in how people interact with it, right? And a lot of gamers, a lot of gamers and companies who cater to them are really against merging these two te technology classes. Do you think they're misreading or misunderstanding what the actual intent here is? I think both. I think gamers are largely misreading, misunderstanding the intent. I mean, obviously, if you went to the average gamer and said, hey, when you play um, Tech Mobile, you know, which is obviously no longer an active franchise, like you can, your wins and your the money you spend into it, the, the digital assets you get to keep and use in hypothetically Madden 23, right? Obviously, there are a lot of things that have to happen to make that, that a reality, but but functionally, this, this is what Web3 allows, is for you to bring an investment you made in a digital ecosystem and, and keep that value across your lifetime as a gamer. The reality is most of what we've seen fall more in line with like pump and dumps and, and really kind of cash grabs. And gamers specifically, A, have uh, a shared memory of the abuse of those type of systems like DLC and, and generally microtransactions, right? There's a, a metaphor or a, a visual metaphor that, that has a hamburger that says like 20 years ago, you paid 20 bucks for a game and the game is a hamburger, you get the entire hamburger. And then today it's like you pay $60 and you get just the patty and then like the lettuce and the ketchup or microtransactions and the buns are DLC. So gamers have had to live with that, right? For 40 years. Uh, especially in the last 20 years, it's gotten pretty out of hand and I've seen it destroy really good games. Uh, Evolve comes to mind. It's, it was kind of a you know, player, players as a team versus a player who's a monster. It was a great concept, but it was destroyed because the microtransactions basically segmented the ecosystem so much that no one could basically play in a community. Uh, and then the, a great game died. The other piece of this is, you know, it, Gamers are, are sophisticated consumers of digital entertainment, almost like connoisseurs. And if you look at what's in the mainstream ecosystem today for Web3 gaming, play to earn gaming, just the fidelity isn't there. The, the fun factor is not there. So I think between kind of the hyper monetization and the, the cash grab plus the fun factor and the quality not being what's the standard is today for gaming, it, it's not a surprise to me that gamers, you know, kind of mainstream gamers are resistant, if not even directly and aggressively opposed to Web3 gaming. So maybe we talk about uh, whether Web3 technologies can have a positive impact on esports and tournaments. 
I think there's still potential there. I, I think what we've seen now has been kind of misguided by greed um, and ego, but I, I definitely see the potential for, again, go back to um, the international, which is Dota 2, you know, they raised $40 million uh, most recently for their the tournament prize through crowdsource purchases. So the community basically came together and created this prize pool. I would love to see that happen for social good efforts, right? Uh, you know, providing fresh water and, and you know, lead free water in Flint, Michigan, or, or you know, name the the area of impact in, in any given society uh, or, or community, there's always something that needs to be done within a local area. How can that local community leverage esports where they're providing value to the winners, but also providing value to the community? I, I think that's actually a really interesting point because frankly, I, th I think that um, Web3 technology is just a technology. Like whether it's used for good or used for ill, there's uh, people with intent behind it. Those types of technologies uh, used for um, passing money easily, uh, doing the things that Web3 does really well, holding money in trust at a smart contract level, and upon fulfillment, passing it to those that need it. And I think that much of uh, what Web3 technology is used for today is frankly not that. And that has to come from us who are building the, te the technologies and not uh, those who are using the technologies. Yeah, if you think about, and you understand this, uh, you know, blockchain is great at mathematically introducing trust into traditionally untrusted networks, right? right. So issues where, where there are issues of, of people-based trust and integrity and ethics, ideally you could leverage smart contracts to codify a workflow that, that prevents abuse of trust and ethics. Right. For example, uh, there are several instances in esports where you have teams who have contracts with, with their players where they're supposed to receive prize winnings and then distribute a, a predetermined amount of those winnings back to the players. And that doesn't always happen, right? But if you had that process kind of managed with smart contracts, it would happen automatically because you've written in that workflow into the code within the blockchain. So whenever the, the you know currency or whatever the, the digital value is created, it automatically goes to that the winning player. So you don't have to worry about that. There's also issues with like players roster changes or or eligibility for players, right? If you use KYC to, to verify that the people who are playing are actually at least the age of 13. We've got some issues in esports so that happens as well. So I think there are several examples like that where operationally you could codify uh, the business logic within the smart contracts to create more equity, more transparency, more accountability, and, and ultimately more trust within esports. Marcus, I really appreciate your thoughts and your expertise. And I wanted to thank you again for coming on the show today. Thank you for the time. I appreciate it. The future of gaming is about all of us and primarily happens through you, the gaming audience. So a quick reminder that every like, comment, rating, or share helps us grow this show. Let's spread the word about what we're trying to achieve here at Ultra. 